Hello, everyone. We are just going to give it a couple minutes for people to jump on and then we'll jump into today's webinar. Awesome. For the people that have just joined, we're just giving it a minute here, letting people hop onto the call. Um, and then in a minute or so, we will dive into our webinar with Maya HTT and uh, our lovely Remy Duquette. Perfect. Why don't we hop in? So hello, everyone. I'm Nicole Rathi. I run AI for Manufacturing Canada. Um, we are an organization focused on connecting AI companies and manufacturing companies in Canada um, to really get educated, to adopt technology and have these conversations like we're going to have today about um, where to start, where to go, the use cases within the ecosystem. Um, so today I am excited to welcome you to our webinar, Leveraging Generative AI to Expedite Troubleshooting and Document Search in Manufacturing, um, a quantitative analysis from my HTT uh, about MBOT clients. Um, and so today we are joined by Remy Duquette, a Vice President of Innovation and Industrial AI at my HTT. Um, the man has a million uh, awesome uh, qualities and a ton of experience. So I will pass it off to Remy to introduce himself because I probably won't do it justice. Um, and we can jump into today's webinar. Thank you so much, Nicole, for the introduction and welcome everyone to our uh, nice uh, discussion today uh, on leveraging uh, large language models in the manufacturing environment. Um, as Nicole mentioned, my name is Remy Duquette. I'm the Vice President of our Industrial AI Practice at Maya HTT. Uh, Maya HTT has been a, a Canadian uh, company headquartered in, in Montreal with offices across Canada, US, UK and France. And we've been in business for 40 years. Uh, our entire focus is in engineering, uh, manufacturing, and uh, AI and operational technologies in, in general. Uh, our group has helped you know, 150 plus uh, clients to leverage uh, AI technology specifically, plus 5,000 other projects and clients uh, in other areas. Again, all centered around engineering and, and manufacturing. We're the number one uh, Siemens value added reseller worldwide and uh, an Aviva premium partner and certified Azure and NVIDIA uh, um, uh, partners. So from that perspective, I think you can see uh, that the uh, the complexity and understanding the physics behind the data is really where we we uh, centered our effort and where our value add is for for clients like you who are probably looking for uh, partners like us to uh, to move forward in a in, in a smart way uh, using new technologies uh, in the field. Before I launch into uh, the large language model and how to leverage it uh, using MBOT for uh, for your industrial uh, troubleshooting and manufacturing shop floor workers, uh, just want to give you a paint a little bit of a broader picture of what Maya can achieve uh, with you and for you. Um, you know, we have a, a fairly uh, nice, um, nicely distributed uh, engineering uh, tools and solutions that we can bring to bear to help you either early on in your uh, manufacturing cycles or uh, downstream in terms of your operations, whether it's the, the shop floor operations or the industrial operations with heavy equipment, uh, anything related to uh, what I call dirty data in the end, because <laughs> that's the world we live in, um, is where Maya can help you and augment uh, your, your existing team or your existing uh, processes. We, we target about 12 uh, different industries. Um, you, know, you can probably see yourself in one of the either heavy machinery, uh, mining metals, uh, manufacturing of various products and, and, and components here in food and bev or oil and gas or pulp and paper or marine industry. Um, or energy. We've uh, launched uh, recently also a uh, from an eco-friendly um, 
geothermal industry uh, specific uh, applications. Uh, you can see, you know, some of our world class customers here uh, in in the twelve uh, industries that we we target and support and and service. And uh, hopefully, you can uh, see that we we uh, augment uh, the best uh, best of companies in the world. And hopefully, you're next on on that list here of of nice logos. Um, with Nicole and the uh, AI for manufacturing in Canada, we focus a lot on use cases. So before again, I launched into large language model, I wanted to show the focus of Maya and those use cases and helping you understand how uh, machine learning, AI, and various technologies, operational technologies can help you uh, from a digital transformation perspective. So we, we, we deem it like the Epic M uh, kind of model where we start with E, which is anything related to energy efficiency is where we can add value. Productivity improvements, yield throughput, OE type of uh, raw material waste, uh, you know, at startup time. Uh, these are the, the use cases that we focus on. Inventory, costing, forecasting. We'll see some of the relationship here with LLM uh, down the stream, but with quality improvement and maintenance improvement. Again, all kind of useful uh, components and places where you can start uh, your journey in leveraging new AI technologies. When you yeah, start, oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We've just yeah. had uh, two people in the comments say they can't see the presentation on the screen. Oh. Um, I can reshare really yeah. the screen. If the uh, attendees could let us know in the chat box, if you can see the presentation. Um, I can see the presentation, so unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm not a good test sample. <laughs> okay, so I think we have a mixed bag of people being able to see it and some people not being able to see it. Okay. Well, in any case, there will be the recording available uh, for you. So I'm sorry if, uh, if you have challenges with uh, the, the connectivity or whatever it is. But in any case, it will be available uh, through the recording. Um, so when I say about, you know, when I talk about those uh, Epic M use cases, uh, it's very important for you as a manufacturer or uh, an industrial operator to, uh, to start with your business challenges. So before you take the magic, you know, wand of LLM and, and trying to, you know, implement some AI or whether it's LLM or deep learning or anything, you really want to start with your business challenges first and then apply it to uh, the various areas and move around uh, along the maturity curve of where you are and be very frank with yourself as to where you are in that maturity curve, right? If you need additional sensors, leverage data, put data systems in place, well, start your effort there and then slowly move up the food chain, uh, you know, towards pres prescriptive type of uh, AI control and machine learning uh, projects down, down the stream. Uh, so that's our, the way that we see it with our client that, you know, have had a lot of success uh, over, over the years. So if you look at the success, you know, uh, from a proven track record, 150 plus uh, AI projects deployed, adopted in real in industrial manufacturing environments, uh, harnessing up to 5.7 million uh, sensors and telemetry points and, and other uh, components and leveraging various mix of on-premise uh, operational technologies, edge devices, and sometimes uh, cloud solutions. So a, a mix of, of, of these components. If you look at some of our um, use cases and, and clients, you see here in the pulp and paper industry, uh, using 600 real-time telemetry uh, components uh, for uh, 20 uh, predicting 20 quality parameters in real time uh, instead of every 5 to 15 minutes uh, with uh, quality samples and clipping of, of piece of paper, uh, which was uh, what they were doing before uh, we implemented a data-driven solution and an executable digital twin solution. Uh, here you can see more of a manufacturing of lower volume uh, production. Uh, where you see composite parts for aircraft components uh, being manufactured. And again, here, the, the importance of the use cases, we reduce the amount of, of defects 
but we also link the defects with their root cause and what caused that defect in the first place. Um, if you look at uh, lithium batteries for electric cars, in this case, the manufacturing and deep learning helped uh, with 10 hours of productivity reduction in the cooling time and savings in the raw lithium. So again, very specific uh, business use cases. A lot of people ask, you know, how do I know that AI is actually helping? Well, if you can see here in, this, in the signal itself, um, for the control volume of, of the components that was uh, actually measured, you can see that as soon as we enabled a, an AI component, you can see how better the control uh, you know, becomes. And then over time, uh, that means for all the parts, the mechanical parts in the systems, they get less strained. So the lifing, the parts lifing gets extended and you get reduced amount of unplanned maintenance and even you know, longer time frame for your maintenance between maintenances, which you save costs on, on the back end. But really, that's really how you can vis visualize it. Uh, we've done it for very large fleets of, of industrial equipment, like in this case, uh, you know, shipping companies that are shipping goods uh, around the world. In this case, CSL, uh, we can mention the, their name because we, uh, we had a public presentation uh, of this uh, use case with them. Um, you know, we built with them more than a thousand smart anomaly indicators to help them better uh, make better decisions, uh, data-driven decisions. Now, today the focus is not on those use cases, but <laughs> that was to give a kind of a background as to why we built uh, an LLM and leverage, uh, you know, the documents that are uh, there for troubleshooting on the shop floor. Because uh, we've seen a lot of challenges on the shop floor as we were deploying these other type of AI uh, techniques and, and models. So first, the, let's set the stage of what the problem is that we were trying to solve. So a lot of people are asking, you know, where's the textual data that I need to do my job, right? Where the, where's the tr troubleshooting guide? Um, which page uh, is the information to help me troubleshoot this component? Even, even if you know where the document is, you know, how quick can you get to the information within that document? Often people are faced with this kind of splash. I mean, this is, of course, an analogy of a big board with lots of information on it, right? And so where is that information? It's not easy. If you look at engineers and manufacturing uh, people in general, what do they need access to? Well, access to a lot of various, very technical type of information, which by default, in an L uh, you know, a large language model like ChatGPT and others, have a baseline for, but don't have your specific data for your specific process, for your specific machine uh, or industrial equipment that you are operating. So really the, the amount of information is field is very vast and the textual information in technical drawings, in troubleshooting guides, in engineering manuals, all of that information can be leveraged, right? To answer a specific question. That's really where we, we, we started looking at, uh, you know, where is that information? And a lot of people asked us, well, can't I just like use my PLM or MES system or ERP system or SharePoint to find that information? Well, in some cases, yes, right? Some cases, those tools are still very valid, very useful, you know, for very technical CAD 3D, uh, you know, uh, component documents that you want to visualize. Yeah, you know, the, this is still a, the tool, the right tool for, for the job. But when it, we want to answer questions in a chat-like manner, right, that combines a lot of information across these different types of documents, that's where it falls short to answer, and it falls short to answer it in a timely fashion for you to use that information. Right. So that's where the evolution of large language models, um, you know, is, is actually quite amazing for us to leverage uh, from a manufacturing uh, viewpoint. Now, just for everyone on, on the call, the um, uh, in 2017, there was a, a uh, let's call it a, a triggering paper uh, called uh, Attention is All You Need, and uh, that's on the research side uh, that came out and that laid the foundation for everything that you saw afterwards. And, you know, people mostly, um, uh, woke up to 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 you know to the chat gpt version 3.5 coffee but there was a lot of other instances of large language models prior to that so that's what i'm showing here in terms of the timeline 
and the efforts that went into building these uh, large language model. Maya, as an AI uh, company, we you know in the manufacturing world, we were aware and followed right the evolution of these. Of course, we don't have the the bedwidth of a, a open open AI or Microsoft or Google <laughs> to build a base model, but we have the, the 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 power and the expertise to build on top, right? And that's what we're going to present uh, today. Some of the LLMs, just in terms of concepts, uh, LLM stands for large language model. Uh, you know, the parameters are typically uh, what we call pre-trained transformers. So transformers is what I talked about, you know, in 2017, um, uh, attention is all you need. That's, that's when these new techniques uh, were essentially perfected from a research standpoint. Um, but we're talking about very, very large neural networks, right? We're talking about, you know, 175 billion parameters from a GPT-3, the original uh, one. We're not talking about the ones for today. Uh, then there's GPT-4, which was trained with uh, what we call RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. So again, bringing, you know, additional uh, precision and accuracy in the way that the text was formulated. And now more recently with uh, the 4.0 access to current data Data and live browser data is kind of bringing it to another uh, level. So all of these key concepts are, are important for you to, to understand in terms of the baseline. The limitations is often, uh, you know, the language model needs to be understood that it's not a truth model. It's, it's really a language model. So it will, you know, uh, look at the frequency of, of data in terms of the text, right? What came next in, uh, from a probability standpoint, if you ask a certain question and, you know, what are the sequence of words and sequence of paragraphs that should follow? Uh, and so once you start down a path, it will, you know, just uh, outline or uh, chat with you in, in a, um, a very uh, convincing way, but it may not be the truth, right? It's just the next best logical word or best logical sentence uh, that follows, right? So uh, people have deemed hallucinations as, as one of the key problems in the early days of, of ChatGPT uh, that would hallucinate things, right? Uh, make up stories that really didn't exist. So that, that's a little bit problematic when you want to use it in manufacturing, right? So you don't want the, the LLM to provide a sort of good answer, but not the truth, not the good, the right answer to your technicians, because that could lead to disasters, right? So from a Maya perspective, when we looked at uh, leveraging LLMs, the first thing we thought, okay, it's like, we need to fine tune it and safeguard right, the answers so that it actually has a truth backing, something that we can get back to uh, that could explain the answer uh, from a, uh, uh, a chat response to your question. So that's what we're going to uh, focus on. Uh, some disclaimers, those were um, in the early, uh, let's say, going over the last uh, year and six months, a lot of these things have slowly resolved themselves, but there's still uh, legal lawsuits and things. So we're, we're keeping an eye on, on these things. We can't control them, right? The, we're not building the, the large language models themselves and the, the base models themselves. But, you know, there's there are valid concerns on copyright infringement and learning from your corporate IP that we want to address here. So that's, that's really our focus from that standpoint. So, and but to the rescue. First, the business case. Uh, more than 10, 15% of the time of your engineers and manufacturing uh, shop floor workers are spent annually in searching for data, searching for the information so they, they can do their jobs better. Um, so that's roughly half a day uh, a week that you're losing from these very highly skilled people that should be able to, um, you know, uh, contribute a lot more to, uh, to your bottom line and to your uh, profit. So if you look at uh, the solution, well, MBOT essentially accelerates that search and we'll see how it does that. First and foremost, because we want to leverage your specific intellectual property. We made MBOT runnable locally on your premise. So it can run on a one GPU. And um, after we'll see the next steps, if you want to continue the conversation with me, uh, we can send you the specification of what you need to uh, acquire from a GPU perspective to run your large language model locally and MBOT locally without any internet connection, right? So it would never 
send a query outside your whole firewall to another large language model and bring back the information. That's not how we have architected this to work because we did not want your you know, private intellectual property, your private uh, secret sauce, right? So to speak on the manufacturing shop floor to get out your the door. Uh, that, that's been uh, clear from our uh, clients in um, our, all our interactions on the manufacturing shop floor. They want to keep their secret sauce secret, <laughs> which means they want things to run uh, mostly locally or in their private, uh, safely guarded um, uh, cloud uh, tenant. But uh, again, a private cloud tenant means it still stays within your firewall of that tenant. It does not go outside to, you know, to a chat GPT type of equivalent and bring back the information. It stays within your firewall uh, 100%. So that's really what we, we have put there. Uh, in terms of the way it works, not that you, uh, you know, are uh, wanting to build what we've built over the last year and a half, but you know, if you look at uh, a client asking a question so how, how does this work, right? So that it can run locally uh, on your uh, workstation and not in a cloud environment. So first we scrape all the PDFs and the text uh, uh, documents that you have access to. So all the troubleshooting guides, all the machine guides, all the, everything that has technical information relevant to answering uh, challenges that your shop floor workers might have. Uh, process di diagrams with information on the process itself, the manufacturing steps, and and all of that. So you know all of the best uh, practices that you have in your on your shop floor for operating uh, the the shop floor and your manufacturing process. You have those documents somewhere. So we will ingest them locally, right, and then put them in what we call a vector database, which is simply a fancy word to say we're going to compress the information so that it can be readily and very quickly. Uh, read by an LLM model running locally on your premise and answer any query, any question that your shop floor workers will have in a chat-like fashion, right? So there are multiple approaches to this. Uh, option one would be, as I said, you could use an equivalent with ChatGPT uh, on the cloud-based solution, but Again, the caveat there is you are sending pieces of information outside your firewall to another machine that belongs to, in this case, uh, OpenAI, and then retrieves the information or Microsoft, depending on you know, which uh, vendor you, you leverage there for, for the chat GPT access. And um, yeah, and, and so you, you could use that approach, right? Another approach, which is the one that Maya has focused on, is to remain 100% confidential with your data, meaning that it will never, no, no text, no, no embeddings, nothing will ever be sent outside your firewall. It stays within and it answers and it augments itself based on your specific data. So we've run some uh, qualitative human scoring on you know, roughly uh, 10, uh, you know, scale of one to 10, uh, based on uh, a bunch of technical questions, troubleshooting questions, engineering questions. And we, we asked our engineers, right? And we didn't tell them if they were running GPT or our augmented LLM from Maya, right? <laughs> to remain 100% clean and clear here. <laughs> we didn't want to bias our own results. So what we did is simply ask them to score the answers that they were getting from one to 10. And here we can see, uh, you know, from a GPT version versus an augmented Maya LLM version, the qualitative scores that you're getting. So uh, for usefulness, uh, GPT-4 got a score of roughly 6.5. Our augmented LLM uh, NM bot from Maya got a score of about seven. The, on the accuracy side, this is where it gets really interesting uh, because we fine tune the information on the private information locally. Uh, we are able to increase the accuracy of what is being sent. And I'll show an example and a little video of the demonstration of, of the MBOT um, in the next slide. But just so you see, like the, the actual accuracy is much higher because it goes down to the document page and gives you the link to that, that page as well. So let's run a little example here. We ask for you know, uh, technical questions on Team Center. It's a technical PLM uh, solution from Siemens. And it gives you know, not only the answer, but the link to the document itself, 
right? So there were hundreds of documents in the backend database. We ask a question, it answers the question. We can give it feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down, right? If we'd like or not. And it gives the confidence level as to where the information uh, came from. And you can click on it and access the information. So that prevents you know, any chances of having hallucinations because you see the reference on the document and you can click on them and see you know, if it's relevant or not to uh, what you're experiencing. If you're troubleshooting an equipment, well, you'll have the information and the steps in that document and that's where it will lead to. And this is almost instantaneous, right? You can see here, it's very quick. So that, even if it runs on-prem, so the, the fact that uh, you can you know, now have a way to access the information within hundreds of troubleshooting guides that your shop floor workers may or may not know it even exists, right, is really key. And if you think of the shortages in manpower that are kind of predicted or forecasted in, in Canada, uh, certainly these types of tools here will help younger um, uh, workers to do a very good job, right? Because they will have access to information more readily and they'll be able to execute on these steps and these guides that you have and that you've you know, perfected over the years uh, with human beings that knew what they were doing, right? So that's very important as well. So, you know, again, conclusions uh, very briefly, we leave a few minutes here for questions. We compared, you know, from a privacy standpoint, augmenting the knowledge, control, results, variations, usefulness, showed all this. In the end, uh, the on-prem uh, or private cloud version of the Mbot from Maya seems to be uh, faring, you know, much better because we, you know, leave the information very close to uh, the local LM model and we perfected the, uh, the queries and the engineering on how we asked the question also to the LLM and how we asked it to summarize for the answer. So in the end, I think this has a lot of benefits. Plus we have the link to the end document to me and that's the biggest value in the end for the uh, actual shop floor, floor workers is they can access the real information that, that was used to answer their question. So next step, you can contact us. Um, you can scan those uh, QR codes if you see the screen. <laughs> if not, you can look at the recording later. Um, you know, we have a get AI ready type of uh, document and AI and manufacturing uh, white paper if you're interested in reading more about what we do and how we do it. Um, and now if you want, you can send me an email uh, and I will answer any additional questions. Or if you have questions, I think Nicole can look at various questions and try and uh, trick me into answering. <laughs> Most certainly. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I can open up the floor. We don't have any questions in the chat box right now. Uh, but to our audience, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box. Or um, I believe I can take you off mute if you put your hand up or anything like that. Um, well, one question I had for you, Remy, um, I think, you know, it's a really awesome tool to see you guys build. And I'm curious as well to kind of, do you see any key industries that are really ready to adopt this kind of um, on-prem and more secure? Kind of what are those industries that are leading the way in kind of adopting the MBOT? Kind of interesting uh, because originally I thought um, it would be more uh, along the lines of uh, aerospace and defense and automotive in, in Canada that would latch on uh, faster. And in the end, what we found out is it's pretty widely distributed, uh, whether it's a, a small um, metal, you know, a CNC machining shop or um let's say, uh, you know, food and beverage uh, company, or even on the marine side. Um, I mean, it, it cuts across all sorts of, of various industries. So at the moment, I don't see, a, a, certainly the, the core industries that I would have thought would have been um, leveraging at the MBOT first are on, on, a, on par with the others. 
So, and I think maybe the, this is due to the fact that people are seeing a large language model as really as a tool to augment their people. And so that kind of cuts across any industry. Every industry has those needs. And because we run on-prem or on private cloud, it kind of gives that confidence that their secret sauce are not gonna escape, right? So um, yeah, but I to your, to your question, I, yeah, uh, we have uh, across the 12 industries that you've seen on our slide, we, we have uh, a cut across and there's not a dominating kind of industry at the moment. No, we're awesome. No, that's, I think, a, a good indicator to a, a really helpful tool. Yep. Um, one other question I kind of had while listening to um, your presentation here was, I was curious, I, I, you know, hear a lot of, you know, the manufacturing world has those kind of shop floor workers or engineers that have been in the business for so long and kind of have that, um you know, knowledge kind of weaved within them and they're a walking M-bot, if you will, sometimes. Yeah. Um, does the platform have the ability to also kind of take their knowledge into account or is it strictly kind of the manuals and the PDFs and the documentation that the company has? Well, so in insofar as, as it relies on textual information, um, yeah. if the company uh, has a lot of logging of a troubleshooting that, uh, you know, their shop floor workers have done in the past, all that information can be fed uh, into the MBOT, right? So as long as it's in textual format somewhere, uh, it doesn't have to be a trouble like a formal troubleshooting guide. It can be uh, the ticketing system that has all the textual information on the problem and what was done to solve that problem, right? Uh, so as long as it's properly uh, documented somewhere, then we can reference to it from a textual perspective. That's really the baseline requirement there. Um, so, but yeah, we don't have a plug that we can put in the brain of a person <laughs> yet. So exactly, unfortunately yeah. <laughs> until Elon Musk or someone else, uh, you know, builds that machinery, yeah. we, we will be limited to, uh, the, uh, text textual information, but we've seen some creative, um, ways of leveraging, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, older, uh, mature kind of, uh, employees, uh, knowledge. Uh, by running interviews and then, you know, converting the voice to text uh, through voice to text, uh, you know, commands, generating a, a, a huge wealth uh, very rapidly of, of textual information based on those interviews of, hey, you know, during a, the, describe the worst day in your life on the, in the plant, right? And what you did to get out of this problem and and that kind of you know discuss like open discussion can still be referenced in in a large language model from from that perspective from a textual perspective for sure makes sense um and yeah i uh really just appreciated you taking the time today to to chat with us i'll open it up uh those are all the questions i had for for today but um i'll open it up to the floor once more if anybody has any questions feel free kind of um, now is your time to shine. If not, we can definitely wrap this up a little bit early today. Sounds good. And if uh, you're too shy, just send me an email and I can answer to you uh, privately. <laughs> exactly. You just did such a good job of explaining it that uh, there's no questions to be had. <laughs> um, so we can wrap that up for the day. Thank you guys all so much for joining us. Um, I will be sharing the recording of the webinar um, as well as all the contact information about Maya and AI for M um, and the ecosystem that we're building here. So thank you all so much and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Nicole. See, See you, everyone. everyone.